Ladies and gentlemen, please listen up very carefully. We are moving very quickly today. So, of course, today is the start of writing week, so please make sure you are ready to go. Um, thank you for getting in your assignments. Hopefully you see that your grades are significantly inflated. So, um, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, there's a couple things that you need to do right now on the top of your papers. On the one that looks like this, you need to write stimulus prompts, because every time I refer to it, it will be referred to as? So make sure on the top of this paper, you're writing stimulus prompts. On the top of this one, you need to be writing prompts. Do we see the difference between the two? So tonight, you have an LEQ prompt. So which sheet are you using? One or two? Two. two. From period three, question one. Does everyone see how we got that? Yes? So, we have an LEQ prompt tonight. Period three, question one. So, in the period of 600 to 1450, that's the one we're writing tonight. Is everyone clear on the expectations? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the number one rule of writing week? Get your assignments done. Do not show up to my class unprepared. I have zero tolerance for that. Is everyone clear on that? Tonight you only have one essay. It is not that bad. Get it done. Now, I'm going to teach you how to write the LEQ right now with my help of Hemler. I've already taken incredibly wonderful notes for you. So we're just going to kind of watch it. We're going to kind of talk through it to a degree. And then we're going to plan and we're going to start writing the next essay. Is everyone clear on that? Okay, so everyone is clear with the names of your assignments, yes? So we understand when I say stimulus prompts, I'm referring to this one, yes? We can go through, perfect. Just a friendly acknowledgement on your stimulus prompts. There are both LEQ and SAQ. So we will be writing two types of essays this week because we already have these skills. Tonight, however, you are only writing an LEQ. So let's meet LEQs. Okay, on your desk, the only thing you need to have at this moment is your LEQ formatting sheet. I have gone through and I have taken wonderful notes. Alex, I'm not here for my health. Literally, I'm not here for my health because I'm still sick. I am, have a sinus infection. I'm COVID negative, flu negative, strep negative. Everything negative, I have a nasty sinus infection. I'm here because it's writing week. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna show you the Hemler video. He's gonna go pretty quick. That's why I put the notes together for you so we could move quickly through this. I would take additional notes. Be active in your learning and you will be better off later on. Is everyone clear on that? Okay, so here we go. So here is Hamler. He's going to walk you through it. He's also going to sell you some things. I am not condoning the selling. Don't buy anything from him, but he's pretty damn good at what he does. You need a kick of caffeine? Yes, I do. Try bubbly bounce. Those things are nasty. I've tried them. They're gross. Grammarly helps make your writing clear and concise. No matter where yeah. you are. Well, hey there, and welcome back to Heimler's History. Now, in this video, I'm going to teach you how to write the long essay question, or the LEQ for AP World History, AP U.S. History, and AP European History. Those courses are all graded on the same rubric, so everything I'm about to tell you applies to all of them. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, then I can think of no better person to milk them than me. Let's get to it. And let me just quickly mention that this video is just one part of my AP essay cram course, which actually goes Don't into buy. much greater depth in how to write DBQs, LEQs, and SEQs for AP World, AP US, and AP European History. It's got examples for every- You should feel good that this is the same essay format for your next three social studies APs. Does that make you feel good? Okay, because it literally is the exact same rubrics that'll show you what earns the point hey, and what want? doesn't. Plus there's videos yeah. from this guy that you won't be able to find here on YouTube. So if you're struggling with these essays and this might be the thing to help you, link in the description below. So the LEQ is the last thing you're going to have to do on your exam. And you will have already passed through the multiple choice and the short answer questions and the DBQ. And if at that point you have any shred of a life and human dignity remaining in your soul, then you have what it takes to earn a perfect score on that essay, which should be a six. Now you're gonna have 40 minutes to write this essay, which is plenty if you know what you're doing. 
Additionally, they're going to give you a choice between three prompts on which to write. So obviously you should choose the one that you know the most about. And you can know before you get there what time periods they're going to be pulling their prompts from because they've told us ahead of time. Just in case you like a tasty chart laying it all out for you, here it is for your immense satisfaction. Okay, so I hope that helps you prepare. Now, if you know you're strong in one of those periods, then that's good because you'll know that you'll have at least one question coming from that period. Now, step one of earning a perfect score is this, read the prompt. And when I say read the prompt, I mean read the prompt carefully. Don't just breeze by it once and assume that you have. As someone who has scored these essays at the national reading, I know that so many students make mistakes that cost them points simply because it's clear that they did not read the prompt closely enough. Just remember, and I never tire of reminding you of this, when you are under pressure, you are dumber than you think. When the clock starts ticking and your grades are on the line or your college acceptance is on the line, that pressure will knock your IQ down precipitously. So in order to combat that, read the prompt carefully. Mark it up. What historical thinking skill is in this thing. Am I going to compare things? Am I going to talk about change? Etc. Etc. When you figured that out, write it down. Also, what's the time period they're giving me? Circle it. Your essay needs to deal with that time period and not some other time period. Now, one common casualty of the I'm dumber than I think phenomenon comes to the time period. If the prompt asks you to write about events in the 20th century, your pressure cooked brain is going to want to write an essay about events in the 2000s. And hey, I know that right now you know that the 20th century means the 19th but at the end of your whole exam, your brain is going to be sloshing around in your head like some roadside porridge in medieval France. Trust me on this. Write out the dates if they give it to you in centuries. Okay, now that you understand the prompt, let's move on to step two and get that six. In order to do that, we need to cozy up to the rubric and know exactly what they're asking of you. So the first section of the rubric is the thesis, and you can earn one point for this. And in order to earn this point, your thesis needs to be argumentative. Someone should be able to disagree with it or agree with it. And don't just read state the prompt here. If you do, no point for you. So just like in the DBQ, here's how I would suggest that you set up your thesis. Despite counter argument, because evidence one and evidence two, my argument. Now, this isn't the only way to do it, and it's actually more complex than you need to earn the point here. But I teach it this way because when you include a counter argument here in your thesis, you are setting yourself up for complexity later. And let me be clear, in your thesis, you need to be Specific. When I say evidence one and evidence two, and you know, there could be three if you're feeling especially saucy, you actually need to name that evidence. And let me give you an example. Despite the argument that the raising of taxes after the French and Indian War was the main cause of the American Revolution, there's my counter argument, it was the denial of basic political rights, that's my first piece of evidence, and the growing frustration over the end of salutary neglect, that's my second piece of evidence, that provided a more significant cause for the American Revolution, and that's my argument. That is a beautiful thesis. If you do something like that, you will earn a point. Now, the second point on the rubric is for contextualization, and for this, you can earn one point. Essentially, what they're asking you to do here is to put the argument of your thesis in its larger historical context, and the rubric says that you can do this before, during, or after the prompt. And you know, you do you, boo, but I have never seen anyone successfully contextualize during or after the period, so my advice is to contextualize before the period that you're writing about. I think that makes more natural sense to us. So what you're going to want to do here is to write one paragraph, probably three to four sentences, that sets the stage for your argument. And don't go back too far in time, only something like 50 to 100 years. And there are no hard, fast rules on this, but in general, the closer you are to the time period you're writing about, the better. There are two things to mention here that will be the difference between a point and no point. Number one, make sure you use specific historical evidence in your contextualization. And number two, make sure you demonstrate how it is relevant to your argument. So be specific, use vocabulary words here. Don't just talk in generalities but then go one step further and then demonstrate how those events set the stage and are related to your argument. Okay, now the next part of the rubric is the evidence section, and here you can earn up to two points. You can get one point for describing evidence related to the prompt, and you can get two points for arguing with evidence in relation to the prompt. Now, before I tell you the difference between describing and arguing with evidence, let me answer a potential question. How many pieces of evidence do I need to use in this essay? And that is a great question. The rubric doesn't give you an upper limit, but it does give you a lower limit. The rubric specifically says pieces of evidence, plural. So the bare minimum you have to use either in describing or arguing is two. Now, let me show you the difference between describing and arguing with evidence. To describe evidence that's relevant to the prompt, you just need to name it 
and define it. So if one of my pieces of evidence is imperialism, okay, so I just named it, now I go on to say, which is when one nation extends political control over another nation. Okay, so I just described that evidence. I named it and I explained it. But hey, you're not just here to describe evidence, baby. You're here to get a six. So let me show you how to argue with that evidence. And to set you up for this, let me suggest a paragraph structure that will form an argument. First, write a topic sentence, and this will be one of your sub-arguments. So in that thesis that I showed you before about the American Revolution, my first topic sentence would be based on my first piece of evidence, and it might go like this. The first cause of the American Revolution was the denial of basic political rights. Now the next thing I need to do is to name and describe my evidence, and in this case I'll use taxation without representation. So maybe I'd say something like this. The colonists complained loudly that the new taxes imposed upon them were done so without their consent, which they summarized into the rallying cry, no taxation without representation. Okay, I just named and described my evidence. Now I need to argue with it. However, it wasn't as much the taxation that bothered them as it was their ignored political right to consent to such taxation. Leaders of parliament argued that the colonies had virtual representation in parliament because their notion of representation was mainly defined by class. However, the colonists rejected virtual representation because their understanding of representation had largely developed into a local based system. The colonists didn't cry out for no taxation, but rather for no taxation without representation. Therefore, the main cause of the revolution was a denial of political rights, not the taxes themselves. Now, you may not agree with that, but it is an argument from the available evidence. So that's how I think you should set up your paragraphs. And if you do what I just did with at least two pieces of evidence, you will earn two points in this section for argumentation. Okay, now let's move on to the last section of the rubric, the analysis and reasoning section in which you can earn up to two points. Both of these points are awarded for the essay as a whole. The first point is awarded for your use of historical reasoning. So basically, this point is awarded for doing what the prompt told you to do. If the prompt is a causation question, then you'll get this point if you successfully wrote an essay demonstrating causation. Same with change, or the same with comparison. And that's about as complicated as it gets. Did you perform the historical thinking skill that they asked you to perform? And if you've structured your thesis and your paragraphs like I just showed you, it will be very hard to miss this point. The second point in this section is awarded for complexity. And just like in a DBQ, this one is very difficult to earn. Something like 2% of essays earn this point. And there are many ways to get this point, so I'll just let you consult the rubric for yourself to see all the options. But I think the simplest way to get that point is to weave a counter argument throughout the essay. And I've already set you up for this in the thesis. You've already acknowledged there that there is another way to interpret the evidence you're using, but you're not convinced that that's the best way to interpret the evidence. So if you want to earn this point, my advice would be to use specific evidence in each paragraph that could support your counter-argument. And you can't just write in generalities about the counter-argument. You need to provide evidence. So for the argument about taxes and political rights, maybe I can write about how that was more of a conviction among the elite and that for the greater mass of Americans, economics was a greater cause for the revolution, and here's my evidence, etc., etc. So that's how you write an LEQ. Time for you to go crush it. All right, I hope that was helpful. And if you need even more help writing these so that you can get an A in your class and a five on your exam in May, then here's the link to my essay course right here. If you found this video helpful and want to give me the signal that you want me to keep making, then go ahead and subscribe and I shall oblige. I'm the All right. Hopefully you appreciate that I typed it all up instead of trying to assume you are going to keep up with him, yes? Okay, so let's talk. <clears throat> So when we're talking about a LEQ, we are talking about a thesis-based answer. We have not done any thesis-based essays yet. This will be our first one. When we're talking about a thesis-based essay, it essentially is going to break down to a four-paragraph essay, ladies and gentlemen. If you flip over your sheet, you will see. So the thesis. Your thesis is going to be probably about one to two sentences, okay? They're going to be run-on sentences. They're not going to be beautiful. It's going to be fun. Contextualization is typically going to be two to three sentences, and then your paragraphs are going to be between four to six, okay? So that is your basic breakdown about what your essays are going to look like. So they are going, your LEQ is going to be a four-paragraph essay. Now, Hemler is really pushing the idea of getting a perfect six. Ladies and gentlemen, in case you didn't hear, only 2% of all people get a perfect six. So are we here to get perfection? No. no. We're here to get as many points as we can possibly get in a very quick time. 
in case you also didn't hear at the very beginning of Hemler's thing, he said this will be the very last thing you do, and it will be. So ladies and gentlemen, how many brain cells are you going to have after two hours and 15 minutes of writing? Not a lot of them. So we are going to make sure we understand the formatting, the practice, so we can get as many points as we possibly can because the LEQ has the least amount of points and is worth the weighted the least. So it is something we need to write. However, is it something that we are going to crush our souls over? No. However, it is really, really, really good practice. Uh, Thesis-based writing is super important, and we are going to see it again on the DBQ, so it is incredibly, incredibly important. Perfection of getting that complexity something is not something I worry about because 2% of kids get it. So why is it even being measured, right? Anyway, here we are. So <clears throat> tonight, while you are writing your essay, you need to have your rubric, that's this, Pulled out, going through, crossing things off, making sure every piece of information is there. Is everyone clear on that? Okay, so have your rubric to the side so you can be referencing it. Let's pull out our prompt from tonight. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> In the period of 600 to 1450 CE, improved transportation technologies and commercial practices led to the intensification of trade. Okay, what is this essay about? Come on, we have to sit. Remember, the first thing we got to do is make sure we understand the prompt. So what is this essay about, Victoria? Um, no, like, no, girl, look at the prompt. John. Yes, it's technology. It's okay. It's technology or commercial practices that are improving trade. Okay. So we are improving trade. Okay. You need to make sure you understand the time period. So it is between 600 and 1450. Ladies and gentlemen, who does this exclude? The Americas, okay? So, no Columbus. No Columbus. You need to be making sure you're paying attention to the dates. You cannot be talking about anything about the Colombian exchange or the Atlantic slave trade because it doesn't happen until 1492 and we're cut off at 1450. These are the types of things you need to be paying attention to. Develop an argument that evaluates how improved technologies and commercial practices led to changes in one or more Eurasian tra uh, trade networks. So they're trying to tell you, do not go to America because you're wrong. Okay, so that opens up. What trade routes can we talk about, Macy? Um, okay, what else? John? Trans-Saharan, what else? Natalie, Silk Road. Silk Road. So those are the other big three here, ladies and gentlemen. What do you got? Yeah. Mm. Yes, it would score. In this time period, it would score. One or more Eurasian trade now, uh, networks have seen the answers to this, and they do accept it. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, these are your places. With Alex really stimulating his intelligence back there, I'm sure he's got a good answer to start. Right, Alex? Yep, so here we go. What are you insinuating as a strong answer to start there, boss? Um, last few sales from the Middle East let traders travel faster. What's going to be your evidence? Um, on the Indian Ocean Basin, so. No. Emily? Uh, it could be the Latin sales because it allowed. Uh, them to travel year round so they could do it yearly rather than just seasonal. Okay. Just monsoon winds. What's your evidence? The monsoon winds are what stopped them from traveling. Okay, I'll take that all day. See how that's a better answer? Yeah. Okay. So, Latin sales would score. Yes. Okay, Latin sales, just like Emily said, okay, allows trade. And Indian Ocean Basin to occur 
year round. Okay, so we're gonna have to use monsoon winds. Okay, and who creates them? Persians. Persians. Anyone know what empire? No, they don't. It's fine. If we don't know, we don't know. Okay, so we have the Latin sales. Now, ladies and gentlemen, going back to the prompt, okay, develop an argument that evaluates how improved technologies and commercial practices led to changes in one or more Eurasian trade networks, okay? So, allow year round. What are we going to use as evidence or proof? Come on now. Hi, you have contextualization we haven't even got to yet, so you should start volunteering. I know you have been, had a big test yesterday. I know it's been a slow day here, here in AP World, but we got to get some thoughts down. Abby. Well, before the monsoon rains, they would only, like, go one place and then they return one place to summer because the weather is really cold. And the Latin sails allowed you to catch wind in, like, any direction. They could go in and Okay, but we need some specifics here, Max. A lot of more goods to go into rotation and um, stimulate the global economy. Okay, fine. We'll do it fine, but no one is giving me any concrete things here, guys. Max, not Max, I'm sorry. Uh, ben. <laughs> no. You're writing this essay tonight, whether I finish it or not. So I'd open up your notes. Come on. We need to come up with. <laughs> okay. Now, I would have picked camels. Love them. They're cute. This is what type of stuff I'm looking for. Camels are new technology to the region. Makes Malai the most powerful West African civilization. Timbuktu is the capital city. Connects Sub-Saharan to Swahili city-states. Brings huge Muslim influence. This is, these are the types of pieces of information we have to have when we're talking about Latin sales. Yes? So give me some more information that adds some literal and like impressment of knowledge you have. <clears throat> well, then we should pick something else. And you can't use camels. Caravans. Cam caravans is a terrible answer. It's a, not a new piece of technology. Caravans have been around. So we're scratching the Latin. The I don't know. Does the Duke have Latin sales? Oh, do they combine yes, that? Yes, they do. So let's talk about that. Scratched. Unscratched. Wait, it's too hard. <laughs> Okay, it's from they put the Latin sales on the dukes so that wait, if it's also commercial practice, can you like talk about policing on silk Absolutely. Models? Absolutely. Policing of silk roads. All right, here we go. So what do we got? Models. Natalie, what do you got? Abby, we're not. Well, the silk roads were So grown, was united under Mongols. They implement policing to ensure what? There we go. All right, so what's some of our evidence here? Come on now. Abby? But the, we're talking about policing. Ben. Wait, wait, what? Okay. Um, executed criminals, fine. Criminals publicly, I think, is important. Why would they do that publicly? As an example, Max, what else we got? Oh, I was going to answer that question. Oh, okay. Victoria? Okay, fine. Yes. Okay. What's another thing we can add about police in the Silk Roads? Mr. Jackson? That allowed more uh, traders to be open to going across the continent, which was revolution and... Hold on. 
facilitates uh, larger trading opportunities. Okay, fine. Isabel? Okay, it's not really, guys, it's not really about the safety. It's the what are the Mongols really worried about? Do they really care about the human life? So what do they care about? The money. The money. So, okay, it's all about the money. And what is the other ways, okay, that they're facilitating and sharing? Paper money, yes. Yeah, of course. Okay, so it's about money. It's really about the paper money and ensuring. What do you got, uh, Ben? Okay, flying cash is a great example. Flying cash. Banking houses. This is good evidence. Do we see the difference between what we have here and what we had up there? Hello? It's a huge difference. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, now that we're at least thinking correctly this morning, yes, now that we're starting to actually get information down, okay, I will help you with your second. You only need two. Is everyone clear on that? You need two things because it only, it doesn't say uh, three things. If it says three, guess how many you have to do? If it doesn't say it, you can just do two. This one doesn't say, so you can just do two. You can never just do one. Everyone gets that. Okay, however, I really want to focus on contextualization. So this is a good answer. This is a very good answer. You're going to write this tonight. But we're going to focus on contextualization. So if we don't finish contextualization quickly enough, guess what you have to do? Yes, and you are not allowed to write about camels. Camels is off the table. No camels. Everyone's clear on that, yes? You will get a zero if there's a camel mentioned tomorrow. Everyone's good? Perfect. Okay, so let's talk about con uh, contextualization. Contextualization is talking about the period you are in. Put the argument of your thesis into a larger historical context. Contextualize the period before the time period is in the essay is about one paragraph. Okay. So we're looking at 600 to 1450, okay? So contextualization, that is going to impact, we need to tie it back to our prompt, in the period of 600 to 1450 CE, improved transportation technologies and commercial practices led to the intensification of trade. Develop an argument that evaluates improved technologies and commercial practices led to changes in one or more Eurasian trade networks. What could be a major thing that is happening during this time that will facilitate this? Matt. Um, the bubonic plague. You could say that the bubonic plague has stopped trade so much already that... Um, that literally is going against what the prompt is asking us. Uh, right? Yeah. But don't you need like a counter-argument? We're, we're, we're on contextualization right now. Okay. We haven't gotten to the thesis yet. We have started coming up with ideas, and once we've come up with good ideas, then we can write the thesis. Does that make sense? Yeah. So right now, we were just brainstorming one thing. If I had plenty of time, we would have done two, and then we would have done our contextualization. Unfortunately, I don't have a ton of time, so we've done one good one. We're gonna do the contextualization. You're gonna be responsible for your third, but I'm gonna help you write your thesis. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Okay. What do you got, Katie? The wait, wait, what? Contextualization is like big things that are happening in the movement. Yeah, of course. I, I, it sounded like Malta to me, and I was like, "What the hell is a Malta?" So that's why my concern was Malta. Um, okay, so contextualization, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Now, you don't want to just focus on one thing. You want to focus on lots of things happening, okay? Because it's got to be worldwide. It's not just that region. So, Katie, you're correct, but if we're going to sell our soul on Mongols in our one of our answers, we don't want to talk about it in the contextualization either. Isabel. Um, uh, that's, not, that's a pretty narrow. Okay, let me, let me do this one, and then we can work on this together next time, yes? Okay, contextualization, 600 to 1450. Okay, around the world. 
Empires are rising. To meet arising to meet the new demands of society like uh, booming trade inter uh, booming inter interregional trade and developing large militaries. These empires, these empires will focus creating more effective strategies to achieve wealth and power. An example of countries rising to meet trade expectations to meet trade to meet trade, uh, huh? Threshold, sure. Threshold is are the are the kingdoms in Africa created. New trade routes to attract wealth and power like that of, uh, oh, who do we always talk about? Malai. Okay, another example of booming empires expanding their political and economic control would be that of the what? Song <laughs> Would be that of the Spice Island, sure. Of Malaysia. <clears throat> Who will benefit from increased ocean travel. Perfect. Around the world, empires are, empires are rising to meet the new demands of society, like booming interregional trade and developing large uh, militaries. These empires will focus on creating more effective strategies to achieve wealth and power, an example of a country rising. Perfect. So we've essentially set the foundation. So ladies and gentlemen, so what that means, is now we gotta look at, so we have our contextualization. What is our contextualization major theme, ladies and gentlemen? Hello? Kingdoms. kingdoms, the rise of kingdoms and stuff like that, yes? So, kingdoms are a big theme. Kingdoms. Then you also have, um, okay, we are focusing on strategies to improve trade. So, it is always best, ladies and gentlemen, to plan out essentially what you're talking about. We're talking about policing of the Silk Road, okay? Once you got your plan done, then come up with your contextualization, which is gonna come up with like your beautiful, long, big theme, yes? 
Then you're going to come up with your thesis. Okay, so this is your thesis. When we talk about a thesis, it needs to be argumentative. People should be able to agree or disagree with it. Don't just restate the prompt. Okay. All right. Despite the fact not all, despite, uh, despite the fact that not all of Eurasia was booming. Actually, I don't want to use booming. Was benefiting because I'm trying to look at my prompt here and I can't find it, found it, uh, is uh, despite the fact that not all of Eurasia is benefiting from improved technology and commercial practices, Mongolian, um, uh, Mongol, um, hold on, hold on, sorry, I'm writing this as I'm going with you, despite the fact that not all of Eurasia is benefiting from improved technologies and commercial practices, <laughs> empires, like the Mongols, the Mongolian um, empires like the Mongols will implement Silk Road policing to protect cash flow. And, and I'm just going to leave a nice, big blank, because you need to fill that in, yes? You're welcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've written two parts for you. So, despite the fact that all of Eurasia is benefiting from improved technologies and uh, commercial practices, empires like the Mongols will implement the Silk Road policing and perfect cash flow and whatever you have. These practices will allow kingdoms and empires to flourish economically and politically. Okay, so we're starting to tie it into our prompt. Uh, tie it into what will be our contextualization. So ladies and gentlemen, this is paragraph one. We get that, yes? Which is incomplete because you have a huge draw line. Your contextualization is paragraph two. Okay, and then your policing is paragraph Three, and we have no idea what? Paragraph four. Does everyone see how this essay is already starting to take shape? Now, <clears throat> you are going to have to do a little bit of finesse, yes? Because I don't know what your fourth is going to be, yes? So it's not just a blind copy of what you have, but everyone sees how this is going to come together, okay? So we're using the basic formatting here as you go. What do you got, Amelia? Yep. You cannot write about the Mongols, people. You have to come up with something different. I mean, uh, Isabel. Mm -mm. You want to show that you understand the whole world and not just one part. Okay. You cannot talk about something in your contextualization that you use in your essay. Does that make sense? It has to be outside. Katie. 
Your what? Yep. Yeah. All of these. This is a great question. Ladies and gentlemen, please listen. How much time do I have? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we've done your thesis and your contextualization. These are two separate paragraphs. Everyone's clear on that, yes? Your evidence and your analysis are being done in your third and fourth paragraph. Is everyone clear? Hmm? I have six minutes? Perfect. Okay. So, your evidence and your analysis are being done in your third and fourth paragraph. And that is something you have to address. Making sure you're tying things through. Adding information to it. Ben. We're not really arguing the counter argument. We're acknowledging it because it allows us to show well rounded understanding of what's happening. But I'm a person who plays the numbers, and it just doesn't make sense to sell our souls on trying to earn that 2% thing that people earn. You know what I mean? So, but, like, if you're going to, could you write about like, how people interact with like, these numbers? But, like, you're not going to have time, dude. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to set you up for failure. You can absolutely get a five without getting perfect scores. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Never in my life have I ever taught the complexity point at any point in my life. And I've had a 96% pass rate in AP World. And I've had 44 kids get fives in just one test. Like that year, I had 44 kids. You don't need to do the complexity. Does that make sense? Now, if you can and you have the extra time and you have the desire, sure. Sure. But you, you just don't have time. And this is after two hours and 15 minutes of writing that you're writing this essay. How do you think that's going to feel? Yeah. Okay. So. Let's keep planning. I mean, some of you have put your stuff away like today is over. I, I didn't come back so we could just hang out together. So. <clears throat> yes. No, there's no conclusion. Hello. There is no conclusion. You don't get points for a conclusion. We don't have time for that. If you're not getting points for it, we're not doing it. No. No. Do not give an anecdote. They don't care. They don't want to read it. So. There is no conclusion. It is literally a four paragraph essay, unless sometimes they will ask for three. Analyze the three things or something like that. LEQs have a very wide range of prompt stimuluses. There's tons of things they can ask for that are get a little weird, um, which we'll start kind of conquering going through. However, the most important thing you do is following your formats, Take the basic here, and tomorrow we're going to be writing, of course, another LEQ, and of course you're writing a bunch of SAQs over the weekend, too. Yay. Yay. Uh, Amelia, what do you got? Okay, I have a specific idea for the next question. Sure. Would it be a stretch to say that the printing press is the thing? Yes. <laughs> but, like, how did I know you spread, like, all the messages and All the what? Yeah, but that's after 1450, girl. That's 1513, so no. That's a no-go. You're out of date range. Huh? So do you think that's not the paper? What, your notes? Well, I mean, life's hard, I guess. I don't know. What do you got, Max? Oh, I have a question. Sure. Will they give you three, like, paragraphs? Will they give you extra time or not? No. Okay. Yeah, no. Ben. No, you can't. Why? Why? You've already talked about Mongols, ladies and gentlemen. You can't have two Mongols. So why aren't we brainstorming what is your second thing so you don't have to do it all alone by yourself in a cold, dark place? Can't do camels. And what's your evidence? Okay. Stabilized ships so they could carry more cargo and Stern you're completely wrong. Okay. Which was one that stabilized Well, when you figure that out, then you can start Normal talking. Letter, they could no. What about the astro shoot that, like, okay. let them go off the shore? So they could, like, I don't want to. Like, go more direct routes. Hi, you're literally wasting your time. Abby, I'm over it today. I'm over it. You've hit your max. Isabel. And what are you going to use for your evidence as well? 
Guys, it's also about commercial practices. So what are some things people are doing to ensure more trade? Okay, and what are you gonna say about that? Goodbye. You guys literally wasted a huge opportunity today. I have no idea. We'll see you tomorrow when we score it. Guys, you were disappointing today. Collectively, a disappointment. So, this is not going to be as easily graded as your SAQ's first round. You have better foundation. I'm not expecting crappy stuff. It better be good. What did she put up for this? Uh, you should ask your peers, too. Yeah, I did. Molly was looking at Islamic Kingdom to attract traders. We're not doing, um, we're doing, I don't know. It was a commercial practice, kind of. I don't know. It's up to you.